Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the launch of my book, Decolonization and Legal Knowledge, Reflections on Power and Possibility. My list of people to thank is its own set of opening remarks, but I will try my best to cover the necessary ground. First, I want to thank my family, especially my husband, without whose love and support I couldn't have written any of this. This book is a testament to his love and support. Also, I want to thank my brothers and parents, extended family members and friends, many of who are online. I want to thank my publisher, Bristol University Press, for the care offered through the process. I want to thank the staff and students of the law school for their inspiration and encouragement and support in organizing this program. I want to specially mention my students past and present and thank you for all your insight. A thank you to all the attendees in person and online. Thank you so much for honouring me with your presence. Finally, I'm very grateful to the discussants and the chair for agreeing to be in conversation with me. This conversation is one link in a chain of conversations with you all that have led to this book. I want to start with a word on poetry. Poetry is important to me for many reasons. In the words of Audre Lorde, poetry is not only dream and vision, it is the skeleton architecture of our lives. It lays the foundation for a future of change, a bridge across affairs of what has never been before. I use poetry generally and in this book specifically to engage with the dreams and visions of the very real people who existed and exist through the often horrific situations that I talk about, about and write about. To remember that behind technical academic language, we are talking about real people, people who hope and dream, laugh and cry, live and die. We are trying to hear words that the subaltern cannot speak. I have always been interested in decolonization. However, with the increased focus on decolonization in UK higher education, I have become increasingly frustrated with what I have seen as the misuses of decolonization. So I could argue that the six years it has taken me to think through and write this book have been filled majorly by sheer frustration at people's misunderstanding of what colonialism and racism entail. In response, I focus in my book on unpacking the latter, that is, what colonialism and racism entail or have entailed rather than advocating for the former, that is, decolonization. This, I hope, responds to our rush to decolonize X, where X has been anything from a unit to an institution, an activity, an item of clothing, for example, decolonizing the university, decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing the museum to the more ridiculous decolonizing academic gowns. These moves have exposed our own lack of understanding, not only of what colonialism entails, but also the complicity of our knowledge forms and disciplines in reproducing its logics. So I want to tell you about four stories. I'm just gonna tell you about the stories, not the stories themselves. The first is the story of the Zong, as described in the case of Gregson and Gilbert. In 1781, 130 kidnapped Africans were thrown overboard. An attempt uh, was made to claim their lives in insurance. This is a story that illustrates what it has often meant to be human in this world, how we're still leaving bodies to the waters, whose bodies we are still leaving to the waters. The second story is the story of re Southern Rhodesia, a case decided in 1919, in which Chief Justice Sumner uses the law to unrecognize Matabele and Mashona land rights. This is a story that illustrates the rewriting of what it has often meant to be human. On the land, dispossession, commodification, and dislocation. Both these stories are also stories of time. 
how the time returns in various bodies of water, in various bodies in water, how everywhere we go, colonialism still follows us, how everywhere we stand is still colonial ground. The third story is a story of a young woman of about 16 or 17 years, Guvanweswari Baduri, who died by suicide in her father's modest Calcutta uh, apartment in 1926. Spivak uses this story to explain the deep silencing of the subaltern. In an interview, Spivak expresses frustration that critics of her essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, almost collectively silence Uvaneswari. This is also a story of what it means to be human, also a story of space and time. But more than that, an illustration of how there are many stories in which the law and our epistemologies are inadequate, insufficient, too many times complicit in reproducing silence. How the subaltern cannot speak, not because she physically cannot, but because to hear her, we have to find new ways of hearing and knowing. The fourth story is really my story, a story of how I wrote this book. I had been planning to write this book uh, with outlines since 2016, trying to figure out the optimum time to write it. And then in 2020, the pandemic hit. There were strange media questions everywhere. Questions like, why are people in Africa uh, not dying enough? Questions like, what is wrong with Black people that they're dying too much? And then in May of 2020, George Floyd was killed. And I was reminded of the same questions raised by the waters surrounding the Zong by Matabele land and Mashona land by Bhuvan with Bhuvaneswari silencing, silencing. Questions of what it means to be human, what it means to belong to the earth, what it means to live in the devastation of time. So for many racialized people, especially people racialized black, the video of the killing of George Floyd was a reminder that for children of empire, born into its rift, into its schism, into its void, not enough time has passed. And despite independence movements, wins for equality and human rights, all the power in the world has not resulted in radically different possibilities for us all and the world upon which we currently survive. Therefore, killing of George Floyd calls to mind the many dyings that empire oversaw and continues to oversee, the dying of the earth, of nature, of opportunities, of people with forgotten names and families and dreams and hopes. It calls to mind how George Floyd's last words had already been spoken an incalculable number of times under the jackboot of coercive power's destruction and will certainly be spoken again. Everything hurts. I cannot breathe. Don't kill me. I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe. Everywhere we go, colonialism still follows us. Everywhere we stand is still colonial ground and still we cannot breathe. So to respond to the social production of subjectivity raised by these four stories, my book is concerned with the following questions. Firstly, what makes the demand to decolonize relevant to the law school in the here and now? Secondly, what is decolonization? How has the law been complicit in producing a colonial world? What does it mean to be human in this world? What does it mean to be human in space and time? And how can the law school respond? My final concern is a word of caution, asking us to pause before we rush into action. We must remember that our academic departments are contained within university structures and within geopolitical ways of life that make the changes that we wish to see, that we need to see, almost impossible to dream of. So decolonization is rendered almost impossible 
because the university and the world structure refuse to be decolonized. However, I suggest that we have no choice but to dream of it and fight to see it be brought to fruition. Survival is being threatened on a planetary scale through, among other things, the combined forces of global inequality, racial violence, and climate change. But as long as we're still here, as long as we can still breathe, we can dream of more beautiful worlds. Our presence on this earth is evidence that this is still possible. In the words of Gabriel Casilla Marquez, to oppression, plundering, and abandonment, we respond with life. Thank you.